Hello, my name is John Gatwood, and um, the title of my talk is Have a Go Hero to Airway Ninja Teaching Intubation. So for those of you who haven't seen the movie Kick-Ass, uh, the guy on the left is Dave, uh, a college student with no powers, no experience and no training, who nevertheless decides to become a superhero uh, known as Kick-Ass. And on the right there is Hit Girl, who was trained by her father from a young age uh, and is genuinely a superhero. So traditionally, this have a go mentality is how we've taught intubation. We might get a brief training session, which may include a bit of practice on mannequins, but essentially most of our learning is done by having a go on real patients. And this is a problem. So there is evidence uh, of patient harm from this approach. A colleague of mine, Toby Fogg, who's an emergency physician, started up an airway registry in the emergency department at North Shore Hospital back in uh, 2010 or so. And in 2012, he uh, published the first 250 intubations. They had been allowing SRMOs and junior registrars to intubate the vast majority of patients, 88%. Um, and what they found was if you were a novice, i.e. you'd done fewer than 10 tubes, your complication rate was very high, 29%. Your desaturation rate was 16%, but most disturbingly, the first pass success rate was only 58%. So how do you get competent with intubation and how many patients do you need to practice on? Well, competence is usually defined by a 90% first or second uh, pass success rate, depending on what paper you read. Um, and of the papers that have studied this kind of learning curve, um, around about 47 to 74 patient interventions are required uh, before uh, the average registrar or trainee achieves competence. These studies used a similar kind of training model as I suspect most of you use in your institution, which is a bit of an introductory lecture on laryngoscopy, perhaps some uh, brief mannequin practice and then being let loose on real patients. So let's take the best case scenario and imagine that your registrar becomes competent after 47 tubes. Using the complication rate from Toby's database, we could expect seven of those 47 patients to desaturate to less than 90% and another seven to have a com another complication, a different type of concept complication. And for me, that's an unacceptable level of risk. We know from multiple studies that the more attempts you have at laryngoscopy, the more complications you're gonna have, and these include aspiration, desaturation, hypotension, arrhythmia, cardiac arrest, and death. So the onus on us as educators is to turn our trainees from have-a-go heroes into airway ninjas before they are let loose on too many patients. The problem for expert clinicians is that learned skills are governed 90% by your subconscious mind and long-term memory and only 10% by your conscious mind and working memory. So it can be hard for us to decode our learned skills and transmit them to our learners. We need to go through a series of steps then um, with all the skills we teach to turn from an expert clinician to an expert clinician educator. So we need to empathize with our learners analyze the skills we're teaching, bite-size them down into uh, manageable chunks, familiarize our learners with what they're going to come across and expect, supervise them with their practice, and standardize and organize our equipment and our resources. So the first step is to empathize. So intubation is stressful for novices, and we need to empathize with that. So why do they get stressed? Well, there's time pressure. There's nothing like the sound of falling sats to induce anxiety. Secondly, intubation, intubating your first few patients is a lot more like cricket than it is like baseball because you don't get three strikes, um, one attempt and you're out. And you're on your way back to the pavilion and you're gonna watch the next player come in and take all the glory. No apologies there for featuring Ricky Ponting getting a duck. Next, we need to analyze the skill of intubation. Now, there's been a lot of great work done in recent years looking at the mechanics and the stages of intubation. The old teaching, which I went through when I was a trainee, was that we needed to align the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes of the airway. Now, this can only really be done with some serious maneuvering. Um, 
uh, the pictures on the left there show you that you basically have to hang the patient's head off the end of the bed if you're going to achieve anything close to that or you have to have a flip top head under normal circumstances in most patients and the MRIs in the center demonstrate this it's not possible to align these axes so they show a, a neutral uh, hyperextended position in the middle and then the sniffing position at the bottom and as you can see the axes are still nowhere near aligned so teaching those axes is a bit useless these days and really if you're going to be teaching airway management you need to understand and teach curve theory essentially the airway is made up of two curves the primary curve runs from the upper incisors around the tongue down to the epiglottis and the secondary curve runs from the glottis down into the trachea so you can see that in order to visualize the glottis we need to either flatten the primary curve with positioning and a direct laryngoscope or go around that primary curve with a hyperangulated device a great way to teach curve theory which we use on my airway course is to use an artist's curve ruler and the barrel of a 20 mil syringe here's a video i've made to demonstrate this so this is how we use an artist's curve ruler and a 20 mil syringe to teach curve theory Here's our primary curve running from the incisors around the tongue to the glottis and our secondary curve running from the glottis down into the trachea, which is represented by this 20 mil syringe. The first thing we can do to get a line of sight to the glottis and an attempt to flatten both of these curves is to elevate the head. And you can see how that has a good effect on both curves if it's done properly. A standard geometry Mac blade is designed to flatten the primary curve like so so you can see now we've got pretty much a direct line of sight from my middle finger up here from the incisors down to the glottis a hyperangulated device is designed to go around the primary curve and you can see therefore that we would not ever get a direct view with a hyperangulated device we need to get a view on the screen and our angle of approach to the glottis is completely different. It means we have to use a curved stylet or bougie or a channel device for tube delivery. Talking of tube delivery, people get stuck with hyperangulated devices with tube delivery because the angle of attack to the trachea is completely different than with direct laryngoscopy. Things we can do to improve that angle of attack Oh, don't get too close. See, the closer I get, the worse the phenomenon gets. Back off so that we've got a view of the larynx in the top half of the video screen, the bottom half of the video screen free so that we can see stylets, bougies and tubes approaching from beneath. Second thing we can do is a bit of bimanual laryngoscopy. Pushing down on the front of the neck can flatten that secondary curve and aid with tube delivery. And the third maneuver is to unlearn that old habit where you lift the laryngoscope in the axis of the handle. Richard Cooper has taught us that what we need to do instead is lift vertically upwards. And you can see how along the axis of the handle, vertically upwards, vertically upwards gives me a straighter view and line of sight to the glottis. That's how we use an artist's curve ruler on a 20 mil syringe to teach curve theory. Now we need to break the skill of intubation into bite-sized chunks or micro skills. This is also known as chunking in educational circles. Fortunately, Rich Levitan has done a lot of work here for us, and this is a great way to teach laryngoscopy. Stage one is laryngeal exposure, the first part of which is finding the epiglottis, which Rich refers to as epiglottoscopy. The second part of that is to advance the tip of the laryngoscope into the follicular with or without bimanual laryngoscopy to get a view of the glottis. Stage two is delivery of the tube or introducer to the glottis and stage three is tube delivery. Breaking intubation down into these three parts can really help our learners. The great thing is that we can combine Levitan's three stages with curve theory. To achieve stage one, laryngeal exposure, we're negotiating the primary curve. In stage two, we're delivering the tube or the bougie to the glottis, again negotiating the primary curve. And in stage three, we're advancing the tube into the trachea. 
negotiating the secondary curve. Now, the more I've used video laryngoscopy for teaching, the more I've realized that on occasion, the learner just doesn't know what they're looking for. They'll claim to have no view of the glottis when you can quite clearly see it on the screen. It may be that there's swollen cords or the cords are closed or there's a swollen or, swollen or misshapen or abnormally shaped epiglottis. It may be that there's blood or secretions in the way. Just showing some simple photos of different types of larynxes under different circumstances can really help learners to know what to expect. Even better is a library of videos such as the one collected by the Sydney Hens guys. Another great resource is the Airway Cam, which is a camera that which Levitan wears on his head and can um, and can make videos with, which shows the operator's view from his dominant eye rather than what you see from the end of a video laryngoscope. And so this is great for teaching standard um, geometry blade laryngoscopy, all types of direct laryngoscopy, including straight blades and alternative blades. Because we see what the operator is actually seeing. And some great examples on, on Rich's website. Supervision is so important and supervised practice with immediate feedback has been shown over and over again to be effective and valued by learners. And that's whether it's in the skills lab, the cadaver lab or in the clinical environment. The feedback needs to be nuanced. So a pat on the back when the tube goes in isn't enough. We need to give an assessment of the performance of each of the micro skills and then an overall global assessment. So if our trainees aren't going to practice on patients, they need to practice on something else. And the best we've got available are task trainers, mannequins and cadavers. Here's some task trainers. Now, often they are a bit too easy to intubate, especially with video laryngoscopy, and I don't think they'll ever be 100% lifelike, but they're the best we've got. The ones top right are an attempt to make some difficult airway heads and the bottom right has adjustable neck stiffness, mouth opening and tongue size to engineer um, a pretty tricky intubation. Probably the gold standard are cadavers, but access to them is difficult and cadaver courses are expensive and the cadavers deteriorate over time. So you'll have a different experience intubating a cadaver in the morning um, to in the afternoon when many practitioners have, have attempted intubation. The most important thing is that all practice, whether it's on mannequins or cadavers, is supervised by an expert. Now, an essential part of supervision is also to create a calm clinical environment. Now, there's a few ways to achieve this. Laying out some ground rules, such as if you're feeling overloaded, tell me. If you look like you're getting nowhere, I might ask that I take over and then please stand aside and help me get the tube. Having a timeout is super important. This concept of 10,000 feet, making an announcement, okay guys, we're having a, we're at 10,000 feet now, we're having a timeout, we're gonna go through the checklist. Checklists, in my opinion, improve safety, but they also focus the team, promote mental rehearsal in people who are unfamiliar. Also, it's absolutely essential that trainees know their difficult airway algorithms before they start intubating patients. So everyone's on the same page and everyone knows what's coming next if there's difficulty. Super important as well to standardize equipment and airway trolleys. Ideally in every clinical area where airway management occurs, the airway trolley should be the same and contain the same equipment. Streamlining that equipment is super important. So there's a, a lower number of devices to become familiar with. Now I'm gonna make the argument to you that video laryngoscopy should be a standard in training situations. I believe that you shouldn't teach laryngoscopy without access to video laryngoscopy. There's good evidence that video laryngoscopy improves patient safety overall, and it stands to reason that training will be easier with video laryngoscopy for the simple reason that both the teacher and the learner can see the screen and can see the airway. But this is also borne out by the research in studies where novices use video laryngoscopy for training, they achieve competence both in video laryngoscopy and direct laryngoscopy when they're trained with video. So I'm gonna quote a mentor of mine here, Tim Cook. 
Training with video laryngoscopy is better for the patient, the operator, the teacher, and the team. The patient will come to less harm. The operator will be less anxious, get a better view, get more familiar more quickly. They'll have less proximal distractors to get in the way. They'll understand the airway better, succeed more often, gain confidence more quickly, and know that they can receive live coaching if they have difficulty. The team benefit because they can see better, they can offer assistance, they can predict the next steps. And the te for the teacher, it decreases your anxiety. You don't have that hot foot moment where you're hopping up and down because you can't see what's going on. You can coach live and therefore you can allow more time for your trainee and allow the trainee to take on slightly more difficult cases. So in Laura Duggan's words, this is the best way to avoid the triple F, triple F intubation. F, I hope I see the cords before she effing takes this away from me. She's asking me what I see and I don't effing know. Finally, we need to organize our training. We're all aware that operate opportunities for intubation are limited and there will be competition between trainees. So we need to set ground rules for who intubates. For example, in the emergency department and intensive care units in my hospital, you have to have completed your three months of anesthesia before you're selected to be the intubator. You need to set up an intubation competency, which people should, be, should have to pass before they go on to intubate real patients. And you need to allocate theater time for non-anesthetists and prioritize lists where patients get intubated for those who are on their learning curve for intubation. Holding training days is another way of doing it, especially if you've got access to task trainers like these. But importantly, there's three experts in that room who are giving immediate feedback to the learners. So airway management is a team game. And the best way to practice this is a team approach. And I think the best way to teach that is with simulation. Getting a group of people into a high fidelity simulator, doctors, nurses, anesthetic technicians, to, all together is the best way to learn things like checklists, difficult airway algorithms, and the human factors associated with difficult airway management. There's also some good evidence that simulation training can improve team performance, not just in the simulator, but carried forward into the clinical setting. So back to our have a go hero. On that subject, Toby Fogg has closed the loop at Royal North Shore Hospital. They instituted a bundle of quality improvement measures, which is shown here. So intubation could only be performed by those who'd done three months of anesthetics, in situ simulation training, part task trainers and cadaver labs, mandated use of a CMAC, and I'm pleased to report that they had a significant increase in first pass success rate and a significant decrease in complications down by 10%. So in summary, for the sake of the patient, airway operators, teachers, learners, and the whole team, follow this seven step guide to teaching intubation. So your trainees get to ninja status faster and more importantly, safer. Thanks very much.